Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Spring Garden as we uh, gather together to worship uh, God with one another. Uh, welcome to those of you who are online as well. Uh, it's good to have you uh, joining with us. Yeah, we come here to worship uh, a God who, uh, who raised Jesus from the dead. And as we continue to celebrate Jesus' resurrection through this season, uh, I invite you, uh, if you're able, to stand with us as we worship uh, through song. Start with Psalm 95. says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Now let's sing together.
in uh, the New Testament, uh, in the letter 1 Corinthians uh, 2, the author Paul says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, nothing except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it is in Jesus' uh, crucifixion and in his resurrection that we come to know the fullness of God's not only love uh, and sacrifice, but the fullness of God's power uh, as he has uh, destroyed the power of sin and of death uh, and has come to life anew. And so let's continue to celebrate uh, that as we sing Christ and Christ crucified.
Please pray with me. God, this is um, the greatest thing that we can sing, that we can speak, that we can preach, that we can come to know is Christ and Christ crucified. For in uh, this moment, Jesus, you show us that as God, uh, you are willing to go um, to the greatest extent. You hold nothing back to bring us back uh, into relationship with you, to begin a new creation uh, that gives us the hope that one day we and your, the entire cosmos will be made new, that we will be reconciled, that we will be unified, that we will be in, in love and in grace with one another, with you and with your whole creation. Yet, Lord, uh, until that final time, you know uh, that life is a, is a struggle. It can be hard. Um, and that we often, uh, we sin, we, we rebel, that we break our relationships, uh, that we do things that are unloving or we just don't do things that are loving. So for those uh, moments in this day, this week, that we have been uh, unloving to you, to others, uh, to creation, or even to ourselves. We bring those to you in confession uh, for your healing and your forgiveness. So, God, we thank you that, that nothing we have done or could do um, will defeat Christ and what Christ, what you did when you were crucified, when you were raised again. So we thank you um, for your forgiveness, and we thank you for that great love and grace that you bestow on us uh, no matter what, unceasingly. And so we give you uh, gratitude and praise. Amen. As those who have received the peace of Christ from one, uh, from one another, as those of you who have received the peace of Christ from Christ, let's now take a moment to pass that peace to one another. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to worship with you this morning. Isn't it wonderful that the sun came out? I know I'm grateful for it. Um, a special welcome to those of you who may be new or visiting. We will have a time of refreshments after worship, and so we invite you to join us, and I invite all of you uh, to join us for that. It's a wonderful time of connecting and conversation. Our first announcement is about membership. So Esther, who's one of our deacons, will be meeting in the library after worship with anyone who may be interested in hearing more about membership. And so if you're thinking about membership or you'd just like to hear a little more, um, Esther will be available uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Our retreat is now fully booked. If you would like to, um, still like to come, um, you can email Sam. They were, we're creating a wait list. And so, um, yeah, just send Sam an email at samlee at springgardenchurch.ca and he'll be able to connect with you about further details. 
We're now hiring a pastor of children and youth discipleship. There's more information on our website, and so if you are interested in this yourself or you know of someone who may be interested in this, um, please feel free to uh, reach out. Uh, all the information is on our website. Next Sunday, we have two creation care opportunities that we invite you to be a part of. Um, they're intergenerational serving opportunities, and so people of all ages and stages are welcome to participate. Um, they'll be happening around 12 p.m., and so we encourage you to bring a lunch. We'll share a lunch together, and then we'll participate in these activities. The first one is a park cleanup. So with Earth Day coming up, we usually go to Willowdale Park, just behind the church here, and we kind of go through and collect some garbage. So um, it's a, a really good opportunity for us to care for creation um, and for yeah, us to participate in something um, that shows God's care. Uh, the second thing is um, the garden team are going to be preparing for the summer, and so um, they're going to be transplanting a bunch of different herbs um, and kind of um, preparing some things around the garden. So if you're interested in doing that, there is an opportunity to um, help there will be tools provided, but if you do have any gardening gloves or gardening tools or anything, it would be helpful for you to bring some of those things. Um, if you have any questions or you would like more information, you can email the garden email address that is on the screen there. On May 11th, um, we're going to be having um, a Mother's Day celebration tea for single moms. NeighborLink are partnering with us and Sunnyside Camps. Um, and so something that they're asking for is donations. That We want the moms to be celebrated to go home with a really nice gift hamper. And so if you would like to donate any um, nice items that could go in a hamper for these moms, beauty items, things that just smell nice and make them feel good. Um, we're accepting donations for that. You can leave them in the West Lounge on the table there. Um, another way you can support is just by contributing financially. And so the link there um, specifically for money to go towards the Mother's Day event is there. And so if you would like to um, support this event, um, feel free to donate. Um, I'm now gonna call Maria up to give an announcement. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to come up here to talk about, uh, you know, I was so inspired by Youth Unlimited's announcement last week that I thought I'd uh, share one of my own. Uh, <laughs> just joking. Uh, on May 4th, NeighborLink is having a Let's Move Willowdale um, ride, walk, run. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a nice community event. It's $25. It is to fundraise towards our activities that support social isolation. We're doing this in partnership with the North York Senior Center. And so I just invite you all to, to join us. Um, we're going to have York University there doing some cool science experiments with the kids, um, some fun entertainment um, that represents our community. And, and yeah, just you know, bring a blanket and we'll have a burger and it'll just be a lot of fun. So uh, yes, please come if you can. <laughs> I'll now invite Darlene up. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm sure you know why I'm here. Um, it's only two weeks to our anniversary uh, celebration. Um, if you haven't already signed up, um, please do so, or simply look for me in the lounge. I have a list. I can just add you to the list and save you uh, trying to remember later. Um, also, for that day, um, I find I'm in need of a few people uh, Saturday morning, say around 11-ish, um, to come just to help set up the tables so we can get everything ready and decorated and all that good stuff. So if that's something you feel that uh, you can help out with, if you could also speak to me today um, and let me know that you can come, that would be really appreciated. On that evening, 
5.30 for the dinner. Um, we are having it buffet styled, however, it will be served buffet. And um, so I have some people signed up, but I need three more people who might be willing just to come at the regular time and uh, be at the buffet and, you know, perhaps serve the Caesar salad to people as they walk by or uh, something else. And if that's something that uh, you would be able to do, if you could let me know that also. So we're coming down to the end and, and we've got it all together pretty much. It's just the last minute things. And I'm still awaiting um, your memories. <laughs> Um, we're putting together the memory book, hopefully to have it together that night um, so that you can view it. So if you haven't already written a memory this size, it can be half a page, the whole page, I'm easy, but um, I'm sure everybody here has a memory. If that's something um, that you can get done and hand in, um, pr probably by uh, next Sunday, I would really appreciate that so I can get the book ready for that night. So uh, again, we're really excited about getting together to celebrate the 75 wonderful years God's given us here. And uh, we just look forward to that day. Thank you. Thanks, Darlene. Um, if you missed any of the announcements and you want to uh, track back, everything is on our website, um, and it's also included in our weekly email. So if you're not receiving our weekly email and you would like to, you can just subscribe on our website as well, um, and that way you can receive this information in a variety of different ways. I'm now going to invite um, Karen to do the children and youth blessing. Good morning. The scripture verse I have chosen this morning for the children and youth is Psalm 91, verse 14. The Lord will shield, shelter, and safeguard us when we acknowledge him in our family. Children and youth, please cup your hands to receive the blessing, and adults, please stretch out your hands to the children and youth near you. Dear God, we praise you for your love and faithfulness. We thank you for your protection and care for our children and youth. Thank you that you give us the wisdom to lead and teach them. Watch over them, protect them, and keep them safe. Help them to give their lives over to you and teach them to follow your ways. Amen. Children and youth, you may now head downstairs for your programs. I'm back. <laughs> um, let's pray together. Lord, we just want to give you thanks for all your blessings you give us every day. For the wonderful place we have here to worship. For watching over us, leading us, and being with us for over 75 years. <clears throat> we pray for the upcoming celebration where we will share our memories and all our blessings. Lord, at this time, we want to lift up the university students as they finish off another year. Help them as they finish off assignments or write exams, and bless them this summer, whether they're working, traveling, or resting. We pray for those in our congregation and our family and friends who are struggling with health issues. We continue to pray for for Gary as he receives treatments for cancer and we ask for your healing for him. We ask for Kishant as he too has not been well this week. Please bring healing and strength to them and to those other people we know that need your healing touch. We continue to ask for peace for the unrest in 
and in our world and the countries around us. Bring an end to the violence and may those that are being held captive be freed. We are so fortunate here and no peace that others just dream of. We give thanks, but we also ask for the same for them. Thank you for our dedicated staff and for how they support and lead us. Bless them and give them strength and encouragement as they are looking to fill the youth leader position. Lord, please send to us the person you know would be the right fit for this church. Lord, we lift all our prayers up to you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, uh, we're going to sing a song that's uh, based on an ancient creed, one of the creeds that um, um, all Christian denominations and backgrounds uh, affirm as our belief in, in, in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as we worship and uh, pray this with uh, Christians throughout the centuries, I invite you, if you are able, to please stand with us.
Amen. Please be seated. Um, today's scripture reading is Luke 24, 13 to 35. It's found in page 859 in your pew Bibles. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their face downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in the last days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is that the third day all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of the angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went out to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the things the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So uh, have you ever experienced loss in your life? Loss that took your hope away, that made you feel disoriented or, or just no sense of hope? About four years ago, uh, just the summer before COVID, uh, I lost my friend, a close friend of mine, to cancer. Uh, she was 40 years old, still had a lot of life to live, but... Um, yeah, she was taken from us. Uh, one of the reasons why this um, experience was hard for me was because of who she was in my life. As some of you know, I, I've been living on my own since I was 17 with my brother, who was 15. Uh, that's another story. But as part of that, I remember when I was in high school and I was at a very low point in my life where I didn't feel any motivation to go to school. So, you know, I would be living on my own, staying up late with my friends, you know, doing what, whatever you do as a teenager uh, at that time. And when it came to the morning, I would just not wake up, right, and not go to school. Uh, she was, but she was one of those friends who would always call me and sometimes even come and pick me up with another friend of mine to bring me to school. Like, she would just drag me to school even though I didn't want to go. And looking back on that, I know that in many ways, she and obviously others in my life, but she was one of those people who saved me. Right? Like, she helped me get through that hard time in my life. So when she died at the age of 40, with a whole life, in my opinion, she had to live with her hopes and dreams of what her future would look like. It was heartbreaking and painful. 
To lose someone who is close to you when you expect it is hard on its own. But to lose someone when you're not expecting it, that is, um, feels hopeless and pointless. And we see in a similar sense these, a loss in these two disciples in our story. We see in the story that there are these two disciples who are on a journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And along the way, they're discussing what had happened uh, in Jerusalem. And this story follows right after the story of the woman at the tomb who experienced his resurrected Jesus. And we see in this story that Jesus comes and approaches them, but they were kept from recognizing Jesus. We as the audience know that this is Jesus. But to the two characters, there is, they're unaware that this stranger is Jesus. And so Jesus asks them, what are you talking about? What are you discussing? Here we're told that one of the names of the character is Cleopas. And Cleopas, in, in a dramatic irony, says to Jesus, are you the only person in this whole region that doesn't know what has happened? When the person that it had happened to was right there asking that question. And listen to what Cleopas says. First, the author makes it clear that they were feeling the sense of loss and hopelessness by describing that their face was downcast, and then goes on to describe what they were feeling. Verse 19, what things, he, Jesus asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Here we see what Cleopas and the other disciples thought about Jesus. They believed Jesus to be a prophet who, had a pow- who was powerful in word and deed before God and all people. But this Jesus was crucified who they had hoped was going to redeem Israel. Let's pay attention to the sentence. We had hoped he was the Messiah. We followed him, gave up our lives for him, our future plans, everything that we had thought was going to be, we gave up in the hopes that he was the one who will come and free us, who will free us from Roman rule, who will deliver us from this oppressive system of Rome and give us life abundant. Maybe where we can sit at the place of honor as one of his disciples, where we can be considered great, where we can be the people of influence and power and success. Their hopes and dreams that that was placed on Jesus as the Messiah was destroyed at the crucifixion. In their minds, what they had given their lives to now was shattered into pieces. What they expected from Jesus was not what was given. Perhaps the loss of their worldview and what the redemption of Israel would look like had to be crucified as well. And there are times where we expect things from God, don't we? We expect our lives to be better. We expect not to face the things that we face if we follow Jesus. If we pray more, went to church more, if we did more good things, God would bless us and keep us away from that kind of suffering and loss that others face. We, like the disciples, hope for a Messiah to do what we want them to do for us. We, like the disciples, expect things from God so that the things, so, so that the things will go our way instead of trusting in God, instead of being open to the reality of the crucified Messiah who has risen. This wasn't the first time that the, uh, the disciples didn't understand what was going on. This wasn't the first time that they put their hopes and dreams in the wrong kind of Messiah. In fact, there are three different occasions in Luke. Luke chapter 9, 21, 9, 44, and 18, 31. And we're in the last two occasions of those passages men- mentioned where Luke mentions that these things were hidden from them. Where Jesus tries to explain to his disciples the kind of Messiah he was going to be. It wasn't the one who will come in power and might to destroy uh, in a physical way or to replace Rome with the disciples at the top, but rather a Messiah who would come to suffer, 
who would come, become one of us, pour it out for us, so that a new kind of kingdom would be established. Last week, Greg led us through the story of Mary and Mary, who, who were at the first witnesses of the resurrected Jesus, and how women being the first witnesses pointed to the kind of kingdom that Jesus was ushering in. Here we see that continuation of the story where the women have shared their meeting with the resurrected Jesus, and we see that some of the disciples went to check out the tomb to find it empty. And they were still discussing what had happened to the body. Perhaps it was stolen. Maybe the guards took the body away or the religious leaders. What they didn't think was possible was that Jesus would actually be alive. Verse 25, he said to them, How foolish you are and then how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The disciples couldn't fathom that the Messiah would suffer a death of a criminal and then be raised to life. Even though Jesus had told them this multiple times, they couldn't understand what he meant by it. How could the Messiah suffer and die and still be the Messiah? How could death lead to life? Why the suffering? Why the pain? And isn't this the question we ask ourselves when we face trials, when we face loss? Whether it's the loss of a job or a loss of a loved one, whether it's the loss of health, the loss of joy, when we are in the midst of suffering and pain, there is no understanding, no recognition. In one of my previous churches, Jin and I were invited to, uh, with a few other pastoral staff, to a dinner. The host invited us to this place. They said, you know, oh, we're meeting at this place, you know, so come, you know, you're invited. And the place was called the York Club. Does anyone know what the York Club is? Oh, some of you know. Well, when I went to the website, and here's a picture of this place, you can't find anything out about this place. You know, the only thing you could find is that there is a dress code. So we're like, okay, I guess we have to dress up, right? But there's nothing about menu. There's nothing about, like, what kind of food there is, right, what kind of place this is. All you see is this picture and that you have to dress up. So we're like, okay, I guess, I guess that we, that's what we do. Uh, and when we went to the place, we realized something about this place, the York Club. Your, the York Club is basically... A place to eat. But it's an exclusive club where only people who are members of this place can eat. So what you got to do is you got to pay a membership fee, annual fee, just to be part of the club. And then you need to pay to have a meal there, so have dinner parties, right? So it's, it's a very exclusive place where you could have dinner parties. You know, I looked up other kind of clubs in Toronto, so like Granite Club is one that some of you may be aware of. So I want to check out the Granite Club versus the York Club on the website. Granite Club, there's like so much information about what they do, who they are, you know, all these things. The York Club, nothing. It is so exclusive that unless you're part of that inner circle, you have no idea what this club is about. And you as the public person have no right to know what they're about. So it's just a fancy eating club, right? And so it was, it was interesting to be there. It was a great experience just because I've never had that kind of experience and I know I'll never have that again, right? But, you know, you go in, you go into the first, like they have like this uh, kind of fancy like pre-eating area where you're having drinks and you're chatting and all this stuff. And then they usher you into this, you know, private room where there's like servers there to serve you. And when you sit down, there's like, you know, 20 different utensils, right? <laughs> and, and with a server who will take your, you know, you don't, you don't, I don't think you even like, I don't think we order food. They just give you what they got, right? And, and, and literally you're going, all I knew for in terms of etiquette, right, is you eat from outside in, right? So just the utensils, just work yourself in, right? Outside in. But then at the same time, you're making, you know, looking to see what you're supposed to do because I don't want to do anything I'm not supposed to do, right? Like, you know, you can't take the fancy um, napkin and like tuck it in your <laughs> thing, right? Like that's, 
you can't do that, right? Like, that's, that's not a thing to do, right? So, you know, you got to put it on your, on your lap and wipe and then put it back down, right? Anyways, <laughs> so, so it was an experience. But what made it special was that it was exclusive, right? I mean, we have meals every day of the week, three times a week, three times a day for some of us, right? And this is just something we do every day as part of our life. But the only reason it was special was because it's exclusive. And if you could be part of this club, that means you were maybe special. Uh, in fact, you can only join the club if a member sponsors you. So you have to be sponsored into this club, the Your Club. But even when you are sponsored in, the whole membership has to, like, you go through a rigorous test, and then they, they will either vote you in or out, right? Like, it's not just, like, just because you have money, you could join the club. It's, it's yeah. It's one of those places. In stark contrast, the two disciples invite Jesus to a meal, which would have been very plain, it would have been a very plain old meal, with no fanfare of honor, no service to take away your plate, in fact, in the story, Jesus is the one who serves them. Jesus, the Son of God, is eating a meal with two nobodies where we do not even know one of the names of the characters in a no-name village called Emmaus sharing a meal together. We can't even find that place now. And it is in the breaking of bread, in the sharing of this meal, where Jesus takes bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and serves it to them, that their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus. The recognition of Jesus in the midst of breaking bread together is what we need to take time to explore. This table fellowship, that is who you eat with, in the time of Jesus was some of the same, had the same connotations as, as we do now. To be welcomed at the table was a symbol of friendship, intimacy, and unity. So to betray someone who you had a meal with would have been considered a great wrong. At the same time, to invite someone to, a, to the dinner table, even say an enemy, was a sign of offering peace. For the people of Israel, on top of all these social norms around the table, shared meals created strict boundaries between God's people and those on the outside. Based on around the strict food laws we see in Leviticus, and even more, the priests were to separate themselves even further from those who were ceremonially unclean for at least six weeks a year, which created this division between the priests and the rest of Israel. And this is where the Pharisees come in. They felt that it was by taking these purity laws that was supposed to be kept for, for six days, uh, six weeks in a year, to apply that to everyday life. So what was happening in the temple, they wanted to happen in their homes, and especially around the dinner table. And they believed that if they did this, that, that by keeping holy and being pure, that what they were speeding up the, the redemption of Israel, that God would bless all of Israel through this kind of table fellowship. They were an ex so the Pharisees were known as this exclusive eating club. And Jesus, this is why they were so offended when, when Jesus ate with strangers and sinners, right? And so Jesus broke these social, cultural, and religious norms by eating with people from different classes and even those who were considered traitors. Instead of an exclusive table of the Pharisees for the redemption of Israel, Jesus had a radically inclusive table as a way to redeem not only Israel, but all people. Most scholars agree that the central strategy that Jesus used in the announcement and in the breaking in of this new kingdom of God was through a radically inclusive table fellowship of Jesus. Jesus' central strategy was through shared meals was eating with people that other people would never eat with. It is no wonder then that these two disciples who have walked and lived with Jesus, who have not only saw Jesus feed the 5,000, but also experienced this inclusive table fellowship, that it is in the exact moment of breaking bread together 
that the resurrected Jesus is recognized by his disciples. There is recognition in the breaking of bread. This new table fellowship was such an important theme in the book of Luke that there's no other anti New Testament writer that writes about food and food laws and anything around food as much as Luke. And in fact, many of the resurrection appearances that we see in the Bible happen over a meal. Luke 24, Acts 1, Acts 10, John 21. And this is, the, this, this is precisely the reason why it is at the dinner table of Jesus that Jesus instituted communion. Jesus takes bread, gives thanks, and he breaks it and shares that bread and wine with his disciples that every time they eat and drink of the bread and the wine, not only are we invited to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus, but in the act itself, in the communal sharing of this breaking of bread, we recognize the risen Christ among us, where we come to recognize that the Messiah had to suffer, that to be great is to serve, that to be first is to be last, that to live is to die. And this recognition is not something that we can manufacture or come to on our own. It is only when we meet the resurrected Jesus, when we are welcomed to the table, it is in this communion that our eyes are open to the bread of life. Verse 10, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. The Greek phrase here their eyes were open, is the exact Greek wording in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, their eyes were open. Do you remember what that story is about? Adam and Eve take from the tree, and they eat, and their eyes are opened to their nakedness, and they're ashamed. In Genesis, we see a meal that lead to sin and death, and here in the eating with one whom is called the bread of life, their eyes are open to the one through whom there is redemption and everlasting life. We're in a series called Meeting the Resurrected Jesus, where we're looking at the stories of those who have met the resurrected Jesus. And by the time the book of Luke was written, those who saw Jesus alive were dying or already dead. They themselves, the, people, the community of Luke, they themselves, like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, are questioning the reality of the resurrection. Yet, like the two disciples who ate at the table of Jesus and were able to recognize the risen Jesus, we ourselves are invited into the story of Emmaus so that we can also recognize the risen Jesus in the breaking of bread. While we're on the road, we too are mourning, experiencing loss. We too had hopes and had hoped that Jesus would meet our expectations and the hopes we had for our lives. We too have lost jobs, lost our loved ones, lost our sense of hope. We walk this road without understanding, without recognizing how Jesus could be with us in the midst of such a loss. Yet this story reminds us that we do not need to be some spiritual giants to recognize nor meet Jesus. We do not need to understand nor have everything figure out, figured out. We don't need to be part of some exclusive club. But Jesus is with us in our pain and the loss because it is through the pain and loss that Jesus redeemed the world. It is only because of death that resurrection is possible. So we're invited into this unfolding story of Jesus. We're invited to dine at his table, a table that is open and ready for all, where we can come with open hands and hearts because Jesus is with us even when we can't recognize him. We're invited to invite others to the table, those who, may, who we may not always want to eat with or be around, trusting that just as Jesus is with us in the breaking of bread, he is with us when we break bread, even with our enemies. What I love about this story is that the one of the two disciples are unnamed. And that disciple is unnamed as a way to invite us into the story. 
we can be the unnamed character in the road to Emmaus. So I want to end our time with a, a thing called contemplative prayer. Well, I'll, I'll read us the story. And I want you to imagine yourself as that unnamed disciple. So let's pray. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. What are you talking about with Cleopas? What were the hopes and dreams that were lost to you? What do you carry with you? The suffering that seems so unjust. What were the hopes you had that you are mourning? As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, he asks us, what are you discussing together as you walk, walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Share your disappointments with Jesus. Is this what you signed up for? What do you not understand or need answers for? In addition, some of our women's, women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What do you expect God to do for you? What are the expectations you have of God that you need to surrender and let go of so that you can be open to the crucified Messiah? As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, 
Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What does it mean to you that in the midst of breaking bread that Jesus is recognized? What does this mean? What does this new kind of table fellowship mean for you and for those around you, even for your enemies? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Who can you share this news with who can you invite to your table Jesus we, <clears throat> Jesus, we thank you so much that you walk with us in the midst of our loss and of our sorrows, in the midst of our doubts of not recognizing you amongst us. And sometimes, Lord, it's just because we get so caught up in our own worries or in our own um, issues at other times is real, uh, just pain and, and sorrow. And so we offer all of ourselves to you, not just the joys, but also our sorrows, knowing that we believe in a crucified and risen Messiah who knows our pain, who knows the suffering and loss, who knows what it feels like to be alone. And that you invite us into this new radical table, this new radical way of living where even our enemies can become our brothers and sisters. So Jesus, help us to dine with you. As we dine with you, may we be open to this new reality of, of this new kingdom where all are invited into your table, into communion with you, with one another, and that you are redeeming all of creation through this act. So we thank you. And we, uh, we, we, we join you in what you are doing in this world. And we pray all of this in your precious name. Amen.
Uh, as we continue to respond, um, we'll uh, do so through uh, song. So I invite you, if uh, you're able and would like to, please stand as we continue to respond to this uh, God of open, welcoming fellowship. We are so thankful that you have invited us to your table, that every place of, of shame or worthlessness or weakness, um, everything we struggle about ourselves, it makes us question whether we are deserve to be a part of anything of worth. You proclaim to us um, that you love us and that we are welcome at your table, that we are your children and that we can come as we are. And we thank you for this gift and this welcome. And God, we want to be people who live like you, who look like you, Jesus. And so we ask God at those places where we, we struggle to see you in, in other people, where we struggle to have eyes for the movement of, of God's Spirit in others, we ask that you would help us to see, that you would give us the eyes of grace and of love 
that we would be a radical community, that ours would be a table that welcomes and loves. And so we offer you ourselves. Um, We ask that you would be with us uh, as we seek uh, to live in you and for you. Amen. As part of our uh, worship is we uh, want to offer ourselves to God in the fullness of who we are. And so um, I, I just, we encourage everyone, if, if, if there's something that perhaps God uh, impressed on your heart um, that might be a response for you this morning, um, I just would encourage you to, to make note of it and follow through with it. Um, part of our worship together as a community and part of the way that we do our ministry together is through the giving of our offerings, uh, financial offerings. Uh, if this is your worship, uh, you're welcome. Please uh, feel free to worship in this way. You e-transfer QR codes in the pews. There's a, a box in the back if anyone actually carries the physical cash anymore. And, um, and of course, if you want to, you, um, many of us find it helpful to do a pre-authorized uh, giving. That's an option as well if you would like to know more about that. This all being said, if you are a visitor with us today, we do hope you feel no obligation to give. Everyone is welcome to worship in this way, but no one is, um, there's no expectation uh, on on you as a visitor. Uh, Let's, um, yeah, so let's offer ourselves to God as we sing this last song.
Now, as you go into your week, may the spirit of revelation open your eyes to the presence of Jesus and those around you. And open your eyes to the welcome of Christ at tables of radical fellowship. All to the glory of our Heavenly Father. God bless and go in peace.